Hi, I'm Deepi Ganduri from the Chrome WebAssembly team. And hello, I'm Austin Eng from the Chrome WebGPU team. Today, we'll be sharing about enhancements to the web platform to make AI run on the web better. And now we'll be able to run faster, consume less power, and sometimes entirely new applications will be able to run right in your browser. In this session, we'll walk you through the basics of the web AI tech stack and the components involved. We'll also give you a sneak peek into the things we're working on, uh, things, we, uh, things that have shipped recently, things that we'll be finalizing, and hope that they will roll out in the near future. So let's get started. We've all heard the story. AI is transforming the way we interact with technology. This year, Chrome released generative AI features, including creating custom themes or helping you write a first draft of text. But much more than that, AI can enrich web applications themselves. Today, a web page can embed intelligent components for vision, like picking out faces or recognizing gestures, for audio classification, or for text language detection. In the last year, we've also seen generative AI take off, bringing with it really compelling demos of large language models on the web. AI inference is available on the web today across devices, and AI processing can happen in the web page, leveraging the hardware on the user's device. Why is this powerful? There are several reasons for this, and I'll talk about the ones that are most important. Running on the browser client significantly reduces server costs. This is especially useful for Gen AI queries that can be orders of magnitude more expensive than regular queries. For applications that are particularly sensitive to latency, like audio or video applications, having all your processing happen on device leads to reduced latency. Running on the client side also has the potential of unlocking a new class of applications that require increased privacy, where data cannot be sent to the server. Let's take a step back to understand how AI workloads can run on the web today. Application developers and researchers build and train models. Those models can execute in the browser, making use of a runtime like TensorFlow.js, Onyx Runtime Web, or MediaPipe. And runtimes make use of web APIs for execution. All those runtimes eventually bottom out into running on the CPU through JavaScript or WebAssembly, or on the GPU with WebGL or WebGPU. We're here to talk about how WebAssembly and WebGPU are evolving to make AI and machine learning workloads run better. But before we get there, we have to understand a bit about the workloads themselves. Machine learning workloads push tensors through a graph of computational nodes. Tensors, which are multidimensional arrays of numbers, are the inputs and outputs to these nodes, which perform a large amount of computation over the data. A few aspects of this are important. First, tensors can be very large, with hundreds of thousands of elements, or many more. Second, there can be a lot of parallelism. Often, the same arithmetic operations are done across all the elements in the tensors. And finally, ML doesn't need a lot of precision. You might need 64-bit floating point to land on the moon, but you only need a sea of 8-bit numbers to recognize a face. Fortunately, chip designers have added features to take advantage of these characteristics of ML to make models run faster, cooler, or make it possible to run them at all. Meanwhile, here on the WebGPU and WebAssembly teams, we're working on exposing those capabilities to the web developers. I should add here, though, that if you are a web application developer, you're unlikely to use these low-level primitives directly. We expect that the frameworks, tool chains that are used to build applications will add support for these features and extensions. And then most applications will benefit transparently with zero or minimal changes. But if you do like to hand tune your applications for performance, then using these directly may be relevant to you. We would love to hear from anyone using WebGPU or WebAssembly. So if you have any feedback, please reach out so that we can help bring the best of CPU and GPU performance to the web. Now, DeepD will get us started. So let's talk about WebAssembly first. What is WebAssembly or WASM? WASM is a compact, efficient bytecode format that runtimes can understand and execute. 
It's designed to take advantage of the underlying hardware capabilities so it can execute at near-native speeds. The code is validated and executes in a memory-safe, sandboxed environment. When you have a WASM module, the module information is encoded in a dense binary format, binary encoding. So compared to a textual format, this means faster decoding, faster loading, and reduced memory usage. It's portable in the sense that it doesn't make assumption about the underlying architecture that aren't already common to modern architectures. The WebAssembly specification is iterative and is worked on in an open W3C community group, and it integrates well with the web platform. The binary format itself doesn't make any assumptions about the host environment, so it's designed to work well in both web and non-web embeddings. The thing that I want to emphasize is that when you have an application that you want to port to use WebAssembly, it can be compiled once and run everywhere. A desktop, a laptop, a phone, or any other device that a browser runtime can run on. While the rest of this talk will focus on features, there's a great talk about write once, run everywhere by Thomas Nadestad and Tom Steiner that uh, you can watch if you'd like to learn more. So most production applications that run AI inference on the web today make use of WebAssembly, both for CPU compute and for interfacing with special purpose compute. Let's talk a little bit more about how compute on native platforms and on the web can be different. On native applications, you have full access to both the general purpose and special purpose compute because the application has full access to the device hardware capabilities. On the web, for portability and security, we carefully evaluate what set of extensions are exposed to the web. This is to balance the accessibility of the web with the performance of the latest and greatest hardware features uh, out there. So WebAssembly is a portable abstraction of the CPU, so all AI inference is run on the CPU through WASM. It's definitely not the most performant, but CPUs are ubiquitous, are widely available, and there are very few workloads that don't run on the CPU. Another thing to note is that there are workloads that are just a better fit for the CPU. So think of text or audio workloads, smaller workloads where GPU bring up is, can be expensive, or workloads that just aren't massively parallel. And there is a pretty good track record of this working well. Adobe most recently used TensorFlow.js WASM backend to enhance Photoshop for the web. Google Meet's background blur was one of the first WASM-based video effects released to the web. We've also seen some really fun examples of YouTube AR effects and web editing in Google Photos. Apart from this, there are also several open source examples like WhisperTiny, Llama.cpp, and other demos on Hugging Face. While I've mostly talked about web applications here, there's also a thriving ecosystem of ML workloads outside the browser. In a lot of ways, the primitives you should choose depend on the model, the application, and the overall experience that you as a developer would like to provide to your users. For example, in the media pipe face landmark detection uh, demo here, you can see that CPU inference and GPU inference are comparable running on an M1 Mac. But there are models where the variance could be significantly higher. On the WebAssembly team, we are cognizant of the whole application view and are focused on driving possibility and performance through the view of real-world applications. When it comes to ML workloads, we're continuing to listen to framework authors and application partners to develop and ship the most requested enhancements. And these broadly fall into three categories. Exposed CPU extensions that are critical to compute, enable running larger models on device, and interoperate seamlessly with the web platform. Let's start with compute extensions. The WebAssembly spec, as it stands right now, only includes a certain set of instructions that we expose to the web. And this is for good reason. We want to ensure that the spec is concise and driven by application requirements. An additional constraint on the web is that we want this set of instructions to be portable. What I mean by this is that instructions um, give us the exact same results on hardware uh, that on, on hardware. 
on all types of hardware. The strict portability requirement can sometimes have significant performance penalties because the semantics of instructions differ based on the hardware on which the application is run on. And we need to generate several extra instructions to ensure compatibility with the spec. RelaxMD is a feature that creates some of the portability by introducing local non-determinism in favor of performance closer to what you would see in hardware. This extension introduces WASM operations that can take advantage of hardware fuse multiply add, integer dot product, and several other instructions that speed up existing workloads from 1.5 to 3 times. RelaxMD shipped and uh, can be accessed by default as of Chrome 114. One thing to note here is that because of the non-determinism, this proposal is explicitly opt-in when it comes to toolchain. So when compiling your application via Emscripten, use the Emscripten RelaxMD flag to generate RelaxMD operations in your WASM binary. As hardware continues to add newer instructions, the gap between native performance and WebAssembly performance continues to grow, especially for compute workloads. And on the WebAssembly team, we continue to evaluate which set of extensions we want to expose to the WASM spec. As mentioned earlier in this presentation, ML models don't always require high levels of precision. Half-precision floating point format uses 16 bits for IEEE FP16 instead of the 32 bits used for single precision values. Compared to single precision values, there are several advantages to using half-precision values. Reduce memory requirements, which in turn enable tuning larger neural networks, reduce memory bandwidth, which speeds up data transfer operations, and math operations just run faster with reduced precision. The FP16 extension exposes IEEE FP16 values to WebAssembly and adds select instructions that map to native hardware instructions. This extension is still in its early development, but we're actively prototyping it. So if there are instructions that would be valuable to your application or framework, we'd love to hear from you. And please file issues on the proposal repository. Pointers into WASM linear memory are currently represented as 32-bit integers. This has two consequences. The heap size is limited to 4 gigabytes, and um, the heap size are limited to 4 gigabytes, and application code that targets WASM has to be compatible with 32-bit pointer size. Especially, like, especially with the large models like we have today, uh, this can be quite restrictive. The Memory64 proposal removes these restrictions by enabling the linear memory to be larger than 4 gigabytes and matching the address space of native platforms. We have a full implementation in Chrome, and this feature is estimated to ship later in the year. Try it out in Chrome Canary and file issues on the Chromium uh, repository for feedback. For the features we've talked through so far, I want to reiterate the earlier point about transparent benefits. This set of low-level features isn't always used by application features, but should be supported by library or framework authors, and end applications should be able to get the benefits somewhat for free. So let's move on to talking about better web interop. Another interesting model uh, that we've seen is WebAssembly as the entry point for special purpose compute. Here, I'm using WebGPU as a case study for web interop. WebAssembly can be used to bring native, web GP na native GPU applications to the web. The same C++ application that can run natively can also run on the web with small modification. Mscripten, which is the toolchain used to compile WASM to the web, already has bindings for WebGPU. We've seen many applications use WASM as the entry point for AI inference on the web, so it's critical that we make sure that WASM can seamlessly interoperate with the rest of the web platform. We're working on a couple of different proposals to make web interop better. Before we talk about the next feature, I think it's useful to understand the asynchronous execution model of the web. The browser runs all the pieces of code in sort of an infinite loop by taking them from the queue one by one. When an event is triggered, the browser queues the corresponding handler. And on the next loop iteration, it's taken out from the queue and executed. This mechanism enables running a lot of parallel operations using a single thread while being responsive to other tasks. 
This is non-blocking by design. Typical native applications written in C++ and other languages are written against a synchronous API. What I mean by that is that the application would stop execution till the operation is completed. Such blocking applications are typically more intuitive to write than applications that are async aware. On the browser, this isn't always the best model to work with because expensive operations can block the main thread and the jank can become user visible. This is especially, um, that, so there's, there's a little bit of a mismatch between the native synchronous programming model and the asynchronous model of the web. This is especially a problem for porting legacy applications to the web. So JSPI is an API that bridges the graph between the two programming models. This is done by suspending the application when it issues a synchronous API call and resuming the application when the asynchronous operation is completed. With JSPI, the application is transformed, so the synchronous operations in C++ are converted to use web's async operations with very uh, few changes to the application itself. So this is a simple example of, use, uh, of computing Fibonacci using JSPI that you're unlikely to use in a real-world application. But I'm using it here to highlight a couple of things. The EM AsyncJS macro generates all the necessary glue code so that we can use JSPI to access the promises result just like it would for a normal function. There's a special command line at the bottom of the slide that we pass to enable JSPI. This generates the code that uses JSPI to interface with JavaScript imports that return promises. There's a great blog post on v8.dev that does a deep dive on JSPI, how to use it, and all the benefits that you would get from it. What's most exciting is that JSPI is, has a live origin trial as of Chrome 123 and use Emscripten 3.1.59 to compile your application. So sign up for the origin trial and give it a spin. <clears throat> Another surface that adds some friction when interacting with WASM is that developers have very little control over the WASM memory itself. The WASM module owns its memory. This isn't ideal because any API that needs access to chunks of memory will then need to copy in and copy out. So depending on the application, this could really add up. The memory control feature aims to provide finer grain control over memory and reduces the number of copies across the application pipeline. This is an early stage feature, and we're actively working on prototyping it. So you've heard about all the features. Let's talk about some caveats. I'm very excited about all of these new extensions to WebAssembly, but I want to set expectations. The CPU, while CPU compute is ubiquitous, it isn't always the best option. Special purpose compute on the GPU or on accelerators can offer performance that is orders of magnitude higher, especially for large models and on high-end devices. This is true across the board uh, for native applications as well as web applications. The right backend to use can be application, framework, or tool chain dependent, and many factors influence where you might get the best performance. That said, we're continuing to invest in proposals that enable core WASM to work well with, the red, uh, well with the rest of the web platform, and more specifically with WebGQ. Austin is going to talk about WebGQ next. Thanks, Deepti. WebGQ is an emerging web API for programming GPUs. It's a modern successor to WebGL. Last year, Chrome shipped WebGQ on Windows, Mac, Chrome OS, and on a broad range of Android devices. WebGPU gives applications access to the client's GPU hardware to perform efficient, highly parallel compute. In the past year since we launched WebGPU in Chrome, we've seen some amazing demos of AI and machine learning on the web. In fact, shortly after WebGP was available, Web Stable Diffusion demonstrated that it was possible to use AI to generate images from text prompts directly in the browser. Earlier this year, Google's own MediaPipe team published support for large language model inference that you can play with today. Here, we're running Gemma, Google's open source large language model, completely on device in Chrome. This animation is running in real time. It's not sped up at all. 
This is Hugging Face's demo of Meta's Segment Anything model, producing high-quality object masks directly in the browser. These are just a couple of the amazing demos which showcase the power of WebGPU for AI and machine learning. There are so many others which demonstrate other possibilities, like music generation, summarization, text-to-speech, and text embedding. WebGPU enables these models to run much faster than they could on the CPU. Here are some results with Hugging Face's WebGPU text embedding benchmark, demonstrating tremendous speedups compared to a CPU model of the same CPU implementation of the same model. On my laptop, WebGPU was over 30 times faster. And others have even reported that WebGPU accelerates the benchmark by over 120 times. What makes WebGPU great for AI and machine learning is that it supports compute shaders. A compute shader is a program that runs on the GPU, taking advantage of the GPU's massive parallel computing abilities. That makes WebGPU a good match for AI and machine learning because it's easy to run parallel array operations on a lot of data. And remember, these AI models can have billions of parameters. So among the numerous other improvements to WebGPU that we've made in the past year, the Chrome team has been hard at work to expose additional capabilities to speed up AI and machine learning on the web. Recently, we launched two new features, 16-bit floating point and packed integer dot products. Recall that AI doesn't need a lot of precision. Shader F16 is a feature which gives access to the F16 type in WebGPU shading language. This is a 16-bit floating point type instead of the usual 32 bits. F16 has smaller range and is less precise, but for many models, this is sufficient. Shader F16 helps in a few ways. It's quite similar to the benefits that DeepT explained that half-precision operations have in WebAssembly. First, tensors with F16 elements take up half the space, cutting memory usage in half. GPU workloads are often bottlenecked on memory usage, so half the memory often means that shaders run twice as fast. Now, you technically don't need F16 to save on memory bandwidth. You could always store your data in a low-precision format and then expand it out to full F32 in the shader for computation. But the GPU will do extra work to pack and unpack the data. So the second benefit of F16 is that it minimizes data conversion. We do less compute by storing the data in a low-precision format and then using it directly without conversion. And finally, web F16 enables more parallelism. Because there are fewer bits in the representation of F16, modern GPUs can fit more values simultaneously inside the GPU's execution units, allowing it to perform a greater number of parallel computations. For example, a GPU that supports up to 5 trillion F32 floating point operations per second might support 10 trillion F16 floating point operations per second. Let's revisit the Hugging Face text embedding benchmark from before. With Shader F16, WebGPU now runs the benchmark three times faster than it does with F32. Here's a look at a more complete application. WebLLM is a project which enables running multiple large language models. It uses Apache TVM, an open source comp machine learning complier compiler framework under the hood. Here, I've asked WebLLM to help plan me a trip to Paris using the Llama 3 8 billion parameter model. On the left is the model with 32-bit quantization, and on the right with 16-bit quantization. The 16-bit quantized model takes advantage of shader F16. The results show that during the pre-fill phase of the model, that's it reading the input in, F16 is 2.1 times faster than F32. And during the decode phase, where it's responding, it's over 1.3 times faster. To use F16, you need to check for support. It's an optional feature in WebGPU because it's not available on all hardware. An application has to first check if the GPU adapter supports the feature, and then, if it's available, explicitly enable it when requesting a GPU device. If F16 is not supported, then you must not request it in the required features array. Then, in your WebGPU shaders, explicitly enable F16 at the top of the shader. After those steps, you're free to use it within the shader 
like any other float data type. OK, so F16 is cool, but what about 8-bit quantization? Many models still work well when quantized to 8 bits. This is popular among large language models, as well as many image applications like object recognition and image segmentation. Model quality degrades with less precision, so this isn't always suitable. But when 8-bit is sufficient, it's half the memory of F16, or one quarter the memory of F32. But we have a problem. Shader F16 gives us access to native 16-bit values on the GPU, but relatively few GPUs natively support 8-bit values. This is where packed integer dot products come in. We recently shipped this feature in Chrome 123. Many thanks to Intel's web graphics team in Shanghai for contributing the work. Modern GPUs have special instructions to take two 32-bit integers, interpret them each as four consecutively packed 8-bit integers, and then compute the dot product between their components. This is particularly useful for AI and machine learning because these workloads are very heavy in matrix multiplication kernels. And matrix multiplication is composed internally of many, many dot products. I'll walk you through a small example of how this works, but it's going to get gnarly. <laughs> so here's an example multiplying a 4 by 8 matrix with an 8 by 1 vector. Computing this take involves taking four dot products to calculate each of the values in the output vector, A, B, C, and D. The process for computing each of these outputs is the same, so I'll drill down into computing just one of them. Before doing any computation, we first need to expand the 8-bit data into a type we can perform computation with, like F16. And then do an element-wise multiplication. Finally, add all the products together. So in total, for the entire matrix vector multiplication, we perform 40 integer to float conversions, 32 float multiplications, and 28 float additions. With larger and larger matrices, there are an even greater number of operations that need to be performed. Next, we'll see how packed integer dot products can reduce the amount of work. Packed integer dot products work on groups of four 8-bit integers, so we'll split the data into groups of four to help visualize the approach. Then, for each of the outputs, we compute two packed dot product operations using the, using the, w using the web GPU shading language feature built in dot for u8 packed. And then add the results together. So in total, for the entire matrix vector multiplication, we don't perform any data conversions. We do eight packed dot product operations and four integer additions. We, we tested packed integer dot products on a variety of consumer GPUs. Compared to 16-bit floating point, 8-bit quantization is 1.6 to 2.8 times faster. When we additionally add in packed integer dot products, the performance is even better. It's 1.7 to 2.9 times faster. You can check if the browser supports packed integer dot products by checking the WGSL language features property on the GPU object. It's not available in all browsers yet, but it's a core part of the API, so eventually all implementations will support it. If the GPU doesn't natively support packed integer dot products, then the browser will polyfill its own implementation. So here is how you use packed integer dot products in a shader. On the left is a simple WebGPU shader which accumulates partial dot products into a variable sum. At the end of the for loop, sum will hold the total dot product between the input vector and one row of the input matrix. On the right is the same shader written to use packed dot products. The main difference is that instead of loading four float values from the vector and matrix, we load a single 32-bit integer. That 32-bit integer should hold four 8-bit quantized values. Then we call dot four u8 packed and accumulate into the sum variable. OK, so those are the shipped features in Chrome that accelerate AI and machine learning. 16-bit floating point is available whenever the hardware supports it. And packed integer dot products are always available in Chrome wherever WebGPU ships. You can try out these features in Chrome Stable today to achieve better performance. Looking forward, we're investigating two more features, subgroups and cooperative matrix multiply. 
The subgroups feature enables SIMD level parallelism to communicate or to perform collective math operations like the sum over 16 numbers. It allows for a sort of cross thread data sharing that is very efficient. We've taken a proposal for subgroups to the WebGPU standardization group, and we have an experimental prototype in Chrome. The main thing left to resolve is how to ensure portable behavior. Cooperative matrix multiply is a more recent addition to GPUs. A large matrix multiply can be split into multiple smaller matrix multiplications. Cooperative matrix multiply performs multiplication of smaller fixed size blocks in a single step. Within that step, a group of threads cooperate efficiently to compute the results. We have surveyed support for this feature in underlying GPU APIs, and we plan to bring a proposal to the WebGPU standardization group. As with subgroups, we expect that much of the discussion will center around portability. To evaluate the performance of subgroups in a real application, we implemented experimental support for subgroups into MediaPipe and tested it against our prototype of subgroups in Chrome. We only used them in the GPU kernels for the pre-fill phase of a large language model, so I'm only reporting the results there. On an Intel GPU, you can see that subgroups perform two and a half times faster than baseline. This is great, but unfortunately, the results aren't consistent across different GPUs. So here are some results from applying subgroups to optimize a matrix multiply micro benchmark tested across multiple consumer GPUs. Matrix multiplication is one of the heavier operations in large language models. The data show that subgroups often have a massive improvement. They're two times, five times, or even 13 times faster than baseline. But if you notice, on GPU number one, subgroups aren't much faster at all. So using fancy new GPU features doesn't always pay off the way you might expect, because there can be a lot of complex factors involved. The best optimization strategy on one GPU isn't always the best on another. And so it's often necessary to do different things depending on what GPU the client has. You want to both minimize the amount of memory bandwidth and fully utilize the computing threads of the GPU, all while staying underneath the register budget. Memory access patterns can be really important as well. GPUs tend to perform far better when the compute threads access memory in a pattern that is most optimal for the hardware. This is important to understand, so I'll emphasize it again. You probably should expect different performance characteristics depending on what GPU hardware you're running on. And in, in order to achieve the best performance, you'll need to make GPU-specific optimizations. So in this chart, I've taken the same matrix multiply benchmark from before, but I've added another dimension to further demonstrate the impact of different optimizations and the variance across different GPU architectures. I've introduced a new technique called Swizzle in yellow. Swizzle optimizes the memory access patterns to be more optimal for the hardware. You can see that the memory Swizzle has a significant impact. Sometimes it's even more impactful than subgroups. On GPU number six, Swizzle provides a 12x speedup. Subgroups provide a 13x speedup, and using them together is 26 times faster. On a few of these GPUs, using subgroups and Swizzle together performs the best. But on others, using Swizzle exclusively performs better. Tuning and optimizing GPU algorithms to work well on every piece of hardware can require a lot of expertise. But thankfully, there's a lot of talented work going into these higher level libraries and frameworks like MediaPipe, TensorFlow.js, Apache TVM, Onyx Runtime Web, and others. These libraries and frameworks are well positioned to handle the complexity and diversity of different GPU hardware and architectures. For most applications, I'd recommend you use one of these. And as we've mentioned previously, transparent benefits will come as these frameworks adopt and integrate new features in WebGPU. And if you are an author of one of these GPU inference libraries and you don't make GPU-specific optimizations, then I highly recommend that you do so. <laughs> OK, so that was a lot of information. Thank you so much for your attention. Now DeepT will help recap some of the important points. Thanks, Austin. Uh, to recap, 
You've heard about WebAssembly and WebGPU and gotten a glimpse into how the Chrome team is evolving both of these standards to make the web platform even better for AI applications. We are investing in faster commute primitives, better interop across standards, and making sure models, both large and small, can run, effect, run efficiently across a cross-section of devices. Our goal is to maximize the capabilities of the platform while retaining what's best of the web, its ease of use, its portability, and its reach. It's also important to note that we are not doing this alone. We're working in collaboration with hardware vendors, other browsers, and many, many development partners. I'd like to emphasize three takeaways from this presentation. AI inference is available on the web today across devices, bringing with it all the advantages of running on the client, which are reduced server cost, reduced latency, and increased privacy. The features that we talked about in this presentation are more relevant to framework authors, but applications should be able to get the benefits without much overhead. Web standards are fluid and evolving, so try out all the new and experimental features and build something. And as you experiment with these features, please also provide feedback. We want to hear from you. And your feedback will help evolve these open source web standards. File issues on GitHub for general feedback on WebAssembly and WebGPU proposals. Use the Chromium issue tracker for browser implementation issues. I also encourage you to look at the extensive blog posts on v8.dev and web.dev that go into a lot more detail about the features that we've talked about here. With that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and enjoy the rest of IO.